Hey, it's good to be back. Um, Luis and I and the girls, thank you. <laughs> we enjoyed uh, our trip. Luisa has family in Costa Rica. We went there. We, we made it a vacation. Um, I joked. You guys thought I was joking when I said, please pray that I see a toucan. And I did. So the prayers were answered. I want, I want to encourage you with seven things before I even get into the message. I'll make them quick. Seven things to encourage you um, uh, based on the trip and just based on coming back. First of all, number one, be encouraged. God is at work all over the world. All over the world. There's also problems all over the world. You're not the only one who has struggles and issues and challenges and problems or whatever, but our Airbnb host also, was a, also drives uh, a tourists, and he drove us to our first destination, and he was explaining some heartache that he was going through and all kinds of different situations, and he said, I feel like I'm um, uh, a boxer up against the rings. This is in Costa Rica. And he says, but I just know, I've been praying, God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I just believe and trust that you're going to do something in my life. Because there where the tur uh, tourism is 25% of the economy, they're really struggling. And he's talking about financial issues and relationship issues. And, but he said, I'm going to trust God. I keep telling God, God, I want the victory that I see in Scripture. And he said that uh, he, he's, his father said to him, I didn't quite get it when he put it this way. He says, but what kind of chicken are you going to be? In other words, with the problems and the challenges he has, was he going to have the courage? But I just want to tell you that a conversation like that, we met a lot of different Christians, reminds me once again that God is at work all over the world. Let's thank God for that right now. Let's praise him for that. All over the world. Second thing to be in, encouraged by, you know, he's at work all over the world. It's not just about Castle or our church. We're part of a global, universal work that he's doing from all ages. And at the same time, he is doing a work here. Don't let this miracle become mundane to you. Can you say amen to that? Don't let the miracle become mundane. When I was there, I told them, a couple of people, about our story, including one woman who had, uh, she's American, she sold her house in Atlanta, she's, and she said, I'm all in, God, and she bought this little run-down hotel in the middle of the city, and um, she said, God, this is not what I pictured. I was picturing the views and the mountains, and he said, but that's not what I pictured, and uh, she went all in, and I said, you know, at Castle, we have a motto, and our motto is? So we know that, right? Nevertheless. And when I told her our story, she says, I'm getting goosebumps. You know why? Because God is moving here at Castle. And I believe more than ever, I've come back refreshed and renewed with a deeper understanding that the vision that he has for this church is very alive and well. And that he has called us to lead other people into their own nevertheless moments. When God breaks through their lives, when they couldn't help themselves, God can help them. Amen to that, right? So that's the second thing to be encouraged by. The third thing, uh, sort of an announcement to go with the encouragement, but um, we believe that when God changes us on the inside, change happens on the outside. The polls show, very sophisticated polling of, the, of this country right now, shows that there's a lot of people who don't go to church, who don't trust pastors and don't trust churches. And because of what's happened with racial justice and pandemic issues, they just stop believing that the church cares about their community. And so that's why we believe here, as we're trusting Jesus, to show them it's following God isn't just about showing up here in the middle of a service, right? It's our whole lives. Isn't it wonderful to fall in love with Jesus? And so we are believing with passion on a project right around this corner that the courtyard will be transformed. And I met with the muralist on Friday that we're potentially going to work with. And he does fantastic work. In fact, the night before I met him, uh, one of the members of the steering committee from uh, Craftsman's Cliff House, the coffee guy, right? He said, listen, I see this muralist. He's doing great work. You should, you should check out his work. I was like, man, I'm meeting with him tomorrow. So that was a cool coincidence. And when I met with him, we had a great uh, meeting. He does these incredible portraits. He says, I really believe when you do a work like this, it has a ripple effect in the community. Isn't that awesome? But here's the awesome part. He says, you know what? When I do these murals, for me, it's my act of worship. So I believe that we're on track. 
and he's, he's got a vision. He's going to come back with a proposal, um, and he's actually available in September. So like anything, when you step out in faith, there's a potential that the thing that you're thinking might not work. But I believe that as we go forward, we have a more and more increased potential to see a portion of this city really come alive and be, and be a reflection of what God can do. Right? Amen? So that's another thing to be encouraged by. That's three. Four. Ha. Richard. Richard's in, out there. I don't think he can hear me. Maybe he can. Oh, yeah, he can hear me. His nep, neck just snapped. Uh, Richard, I was just reading through when I was in Costa Rica one of the serve forms. And he had to update his information, and he was talking about his connection and to Castle and everything. He put me down as a reference. I'm not sure if I'm going to give him a good reference, but he put me down anyway. And he, he's on the serve team. And he said one of his comments in the description was, I'm here for the long haul. And that just touched me, Richard. I, I believe this strongly. There are friendships that are seasonal, and that's beautiful, and you never dismiss it. There are going to be people we see come in off the street for just a day, a service, and then they go. But their impact can be forever, right? And we can have friends in our lives that are here for a season, and then they go, and then they come. And, but also, you need to have some long-haul friends. Everybody say amen to that. And so I'm grateful for people who have long-haul vision for what God wants to do at Castle Church. There's a quote by this uh, person who said, don't criticize me unless you're in the arena getting beat up with me. Is that good? Don't criticize. I don't want to hear it unless you're in the arena and you're full in. And I think I'm appreciative of Richard and so many of you are here for the long haul. That's the, the other encouragement. The fifth encouragement before I get into the message. Hey, the coffee bar is open. But for real, that, what, what does that symbolize? It was shut down because of the pandemic. And here we are as a church and it's reopening and we're here as a church and, and it's beautiful. And Matt from the coffee shop, he messaged me uh, two days ago, and he said, Brenda, I, wanna, I want you to hear this really clear, because you keep charging me for coffee. And he said, the coffee, as long as it's for the church, will always be free. So that was a wonderful gesture. So free coffee, Brenda. Six. Okay, here's another one, random. I got back yesterday and I saw Eddie, the other day, and I saw Eddie Martinez painting my mom's uh, place. And I said to Eddie, I've known Eddie, how long have I known you? Well, too long. <laughs> Six wonderful years, I think. And I said, I said to Eddie, I love you, Eddie. And you know what he said back? I love you. <laughs> so for the first time, I'm encouraged. I heard you say, I think it was, I love you back. So I'm encouraged. Can you please clap for Eddie? We appreciate you. <laughs> Number seven for me, right before I went to this trip, um, happens in life, was a kind of a low moment, low time. You know, you, you need refreshment. And I had in my heart, God, I want restoration. How many people believe that God is a God of restoration? Hands up for that. And I grabbed this book. I had a couple of choices. I've been a terrible book reader for these last three years. I've got this one book I've been reading like a page every week. And, uh, but there's this, this one book, when I was in El Paso, we went to this church, and the pastor there had just released a book called Burn the White Flag. And, um, and so I've had it since El Paso. And, you know, God can speak to you in little moments. I was like, Lord, what, what book am I going to grab for this, this trip? He said, I felt like I should grab that one. So page one, it's speaking to me. Don't, don't burn the white flag. Don't give up. By the way, church, don't give up. And so I'm reading through, and halfway through, I'm like, I, I kind of get antsy. Like, I wonder what, where the, what's the last chapter of this book? And guess what the title of the last chapter of the book was? Restoration. God has a way of speaking to us. God has a way of using a book or using a driver in Costa Rica or using a guest who comes in, using any one of us. He, uses, he used a donkey to speak to somebody. Don't look at how polished the speaker might be or the, how pretty the package might be, but when God wants to speak, he's going to find a way to speak to your heart because that's his intention is to get to your heart, and he has a language that will resonate in your spirit if your heart is open to him, amen? So be encouraged. I'm encouraged, and I want to preach to you this morning about the, the uh, invitation 
to be strong. You have an invitation this morning to be strong. Let's look at the scripture. If we go to Luke, um, what's the chapter there? I forgot already. 18. Thank you. I had the verses. I didn't have that. Okay. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Ready? One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Okay, let me just stop there. God wants you to be somebody who communes with him and to never give up. And there was a judge. I want to take a look at this, the strength of this woman. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly over and over again saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. Does anybody here today feel ignored? Or you feel like you've been crying out? Or in this woman's case, this judge is actually supposed to be fair, but he wasn't. And she was feeling the ache and the pain of it. And the judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, the question was, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Always pray. Never give up. Let's look at the strength of this woman. Does anybody feel weak this morning? Or even if you don't feel weak, even if you're feeling pretty good, don't you realize that you need to have strength to walk in this life? You need to have strength. We are a church where one of our values is to be gentle because Jesus was gentle. There's been a lot of heavy-handed, forced people to follow Jesus-type leadership. We don't believe in that. But that doesn't mean that gentle is weak. Gentle, you can still have strength, right? God wants you to be strong in your faith. He wants you to be strong in your convictions. And actually, when I was reading the book that I just referred to you, I mentioned to you, the pastor there, Charles Neiman, said, there's a definition of strength in the Bible Listen to this definition. It means to continue to insist. Insist. Insist means I'm not going to change my position. This woman's strength was both from insistence and persistence. And we'll get to persistence. But first, this idea that a Christian can actually insist on who they are in God. Man, too many times we let people talk us out of who we actually are in God. Too many times I think the enemy comes up to us and finds it a lot easier than he should to talk us out of something that really we should not be changing our position about. Amen? Amen. To not be wishy-washy. To not be undecided. Do you know that you are a child of God? If you've put your faith in Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, By his blood, which is more precious than gold and silver, we have been redeemed. Our sins washed away. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High. And we are to act that way and to think that way. That is our identity, redeemed from darkness, brought to the Father of light, restored in our relationship. And God wants you to be living through this thriving relationship with him, but the world wants to knock you back, make you feel weak, make you feel like that's not your identity, make you feel like it's easy to talk you out of feeling like you can be who God has called you to be. One of the greatest revelations in my life in the last three years is I don't have to be what I was. Amen? Amen. I don't have to be what other people think I am. And I don't have to be some kind of religious facade. I can just be who I am in Jesus. I'm still learning, but God is teaching me. Amen? Amen? And so there is a strength that comes when people insist. 
And one of the definitions of insist is I will not change my position. It's kind of an old-fashioned thing. You know, when somebody offers you something and you say, no, 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 that's fine. I don't need that. And they say, no. What do they say? I insist. It's a forceful demand. How many people have forceful thoughts about who you are as a Christian? Are you forcefully thinking? Or do you have thoughts that kind of come and go and when you're up against temptation, you feel weak and you just kind of let the temptations overwhelm you or you let your circumstances overwhelm you or you let the trials and the problems get you down. But sometimes you got to stand up and say, no, I insist. I know who I am in God and I insist on who I am in God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, I have been set free and I am free. What? Indeed. Why did Jesus make sure that we knew that we weren't just free, but that we were free indeed? Why is there an extra emphasis? Because even when you get set free, there's a lot of things that's going to make you feel like that you're not free. But sometimes you just got to insist. Sometimes when even uh, the temptations come, you've got to be able to have a forceful thought. So many Christians, and I've done this, can have thoughts that are just kind of whatever I'm feeling. But sometimes I have to say to myself, Adam, you got to remember who you are. Do not change your position. Do not let anyone else talk you out of it. You can insist on this. No, Adam Bowles is free, and I'm free indeed. Can you say that about your own life? Jesus has set you 100% free. And it's time to insist on it. It's time to act this way. It's not just about insistence where we insist on our own way, okay? That's actually not strength. That's weakness. I demand my rights. I want what I want. I always have to be right. I can't not be right. That's insistence for your own purposes. You understand? That's insistence saying, I have a better way than what God has for me. That's not going to lead you to strength. That's going to lead you to weakness. But insistence on the right things that says, what kind of life did Jesus come to die for me to have? Kind of a so-so life? What's the word that he used? Life and life abundantly. Are you living an abundant life where your thoughts are forceful enough? Where it feels like sometimes you're just overwhelmed again and again and this Christian life is just something that you kind of use to tolerate the experiences that are difficult and painful? Or is there something in your spirit that says, I will not give up. I insist I am not changing my position. If you've been tempted to go back to your old ways, can I just tell you, do not go there. Insist on your freedom. There's many people even in this room and in the sanctuary who've had their own bouts of even suicidal thoughts and depressing thoughts. I think it's important to note that you can have a forceful thought that says, no, I insist. God has a purpose for me. God has a plan for my life. God has direction for me. God is so good to me. And I know that those thoughts can come and they can feel so heavy sometimes. And they can make you have a warped perception of the things that you're feeling and going through. So many times we exaggerate, listen, we exaggerate our hardships just like we exaggerate the good times. When those perceptions can come on us, but we need to know who we are in Jesus. Come on, you need to know who you are in Jesus. You need to know your identity in him. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what mistakes you might have even made this morning, the mistakes you made this week, the way that you've been feeling heavy and been carrying around baggage and burdens. No, you've got to have a forceful thought. Jesus saved me, and this is the place that I stand. It actually means this is where I rest. Is this where you rest? Do you rest in the freedom of Jesus? He wants to renew your mind. He wants to free your spirit. He wants you to enjoy the life that he's given you. And he wants you to insist not on your own way, but how many of us are saying, God, may your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. And can we say amen to that? I'm going to insist. You know, this is 4th of July. 
talk in our country about declaration of independence. But you know what? As a Christian, you often need to make your own declarations of faith. Clear declarations. When was the last time you did that? A clear declaration. Here's an example. The Bible says, For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind also means of self-control. So really, you need to insist on that. That needs to be your declaration of faith. You, God, have not given me a spirit of fear, amen? But you have given me a spirit of power and of love, and I have a sound mind, and I'm going to have forceful thinking. I know what God has done in my life. And so how does that work? That means when you are facing temptation, you make your declaration, no, I insist. The temptation is trying to draw me away. It could be temptation to an old life. It could be temptation to some habits that you know aren't pleasing to God. It could be temptations to just resent. It could be temptations to not forgive. But you can say, no, I insist. Whatever the devil's trying to say to me right now, I insist. God has not given me that. He has given me the spirit of power. Amen? Amen. And when you face, what happens? What other times do you need to make a declaration? When you face hurts and betrayal, you can say, I insist. I'm not giving into that. I am going to say that God is a God of love. He loves me unconditionally. Have you had a forceful thought, a deliberate, insistent thought recently that says, I declare that God loves me as much as the Father loves the Son, the Son loves you. Amen? Come on, church. If we have weak thinking, if we're not insisting in our lives, we are not going to live a strong life a strength that we need to carry us to the day that we see Jesus. And when we face situations of intimidation, when life comes and hits you in a way that you weren't expecting, how many people understand that sometimes you can just wake up and the day that you had yesterday that same good isn't the same day that you're having right now? It could be difficult. Bad news can come in your life. And there's something that the enemy wants to do to move you out of position. He wants you to get to to the point where you say, you know, I'm just not feeling this, and I feel down, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. But I'm telling you, church, you need to make a declaration that says, God has not given me a spirit of fear. I'm not giving in to the intimidation. He has given me a a spirit of self-control. Amen? Church, you need it. You need it. You need to start making declarations in your life. People need to hear it from your, you know, sometimes you just need to say it out loud while you're driving. Even if nobody's in the vehicle with you, you need to speak it out loud. God is for me and he's not against me. God will sustain me and not drain me. God loves me. It doesn't matter about these other situations. God is for me. I'm going to step out into my strength. This woman who had a need went to a judge who was supposed to be fair. The judge in that culture, they were supposed to care about the widows. They were supposed to have a sympathy and understanding of what justice meant. This was not a good judge. This was not a person in power. This was not a person in systemic positions to give this woman what she should have had rightfully. But she, now I'm going to tell you about persistence. Can everybody say the word persist? Persist. You know, in your Christian life, you need to learn to have the strength to keep on insisting. And you also need to have the strength of persistence. And what does persistence mean? Persistence means I'm going to keep moving in this direction in spite of any obstacles. I am not going to let this stop me. You know, I've said this several times in this church, but again, when I look around the sanctuary and I think of the different stories of individuals in this church, I am humbled by the persistence that you have shown. I am humbled by the fact that you have lived to overcome 
many, many obstacles. How many people know that God has been faithful to your life to help you overcome obstacles that in your own strength you wouldn't have been able to, but God's strength came in and poured it into your life, and God has been good to you. Hands up if that's true. It's persistence. It's, it's not just, you know, when I read this book and this pastor was being very vulnerable and talking about a season of, he's now in this big, huge church in El Paso. It's a mega church, thousands of people. people and, and people don't get the backstory. He says, you know, in my life, I've had to go through many seasons. He said, I'm not just talking about weeks and months and a year. He said, we went at, through as a church years of opposition. Years of trials. Years. He said, we had betrayals. People rumored about us. He said, there was gossip about us. We had pastors say, don't do that, when I knew we were supposed to go forward. We had to break the small-minded mentality. Listen to this one. We had to break the small-minded mentality of who God is because God is always bigger than the critic who says he's not. And he had to grind it out. He said persistence. Year after year after year. Don't think Christian, Christianity is an altar and a sprint and then you're done in a week. God is faithful from the beginning to the end. And he wants you to learn how to persist. In this parable that Jesus is describing about this widow who just always pray and don't give up, he's giving us an expectation of relationship. He's saying, this is what I want you to do to me. I want you to come to me every day. I want you to have the spirit in you that says, I won't give up. I want you to come to me and understand I'm not unjust, but I am just. Amen. I want you to come to me. It's a clear expectation of relationship. When we went to uh, Costa Rica, we had these, one of those red-eye flights. It was a horrible hour. And Rainey and, uh, offered to take us, and Rainey and her mom, Celeste, took us to the airport. Now, on the way back, I was like, I'm going to give Rainey a break. And uh, so we asked someone else to take us back home. And, and Rainey found out that we were asking somebody else, and she literally said, I'm going to hurt you when you get back home. <laughs> she said to your pastor, quote, I will hurt you <laughs> when you get back home. The expectation, the expectation was clear. It is not too much trouble, she's saying, for me to ask her for help. It's not too much trouble, even though it might be late in the hour, it's not too much trouble, and I'm going to ask her the next time. <laughs> the, the relationship has been established, and now it's clarified, and now I know. And Jesus is saying to you in your seat this morning, I want you to know about my relationship with you. I want to be really clear and let's establish something this morning that you can come to me anytime you need to. And I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to give up. And I know sometimes you're going to feel like your prayers aren't being answered. But he's establishing something very clear. And he's saying, I am hearing your prayers. And somebody here does need to know that even though you've been praying the same prayer for so long and it doesn't seem like anything's happening, and maybe it feels like it's getting worse, the expectation in your relationship with Jesus is that he's heard every single one of your prayers. The darkest prayers and the darkest nights. Luis's sister-in-law, you know, they, they have humble beginnings. Uh, I, I just love the family. Um, they're just a simple faith. You know there's going to be a lot of Christians we meet in heaven that, that never took a stage. And they might get the biggest rewards. Because honestly, I know that's said in church a lot, but honestly. Somebody who's not looking for the spotlight. The person praying for the pastors. And, and their faith that knows that their roots and their origins, they came from nothing, and now they have something in God. They have everything they need in God. And so the sister-in-law, they don't have a lot of money, but, but they didn't have a vehicle. So they've been praying. She said, I got a word. This is not about saying I insist to get whatever I want. This is her saying, Lord, I believe that our family should have a van. And I insist and persist on this. And so she said, I got a word. And for two years she prayed. 
God, please, I, I, I want a van for my family. Does anybody know what a prayer is like? That? Have you prayed anything longer than two minutes? Hands up if you prayed anything longer than two minutes. And it's been in your heart. Maybe something's going to speak to you right now that God hears. And he sees your persistence. So two years you prayed, and God answered the prayer, and they finally got a van. It could barely get up the mountain. I had to close my eyes once or twice. The brakes coming back down, but they got their van. And God is so good, isn't he? God wants Christians, his followers, to be strong. He wants us to insist. That means this is the position I stand on. I am a child of God, and you're not talking me out of it. Amen? Amen. Can we have some stronger Christians in here? Can we have some stronger Christians who face this world? You're going to go through some painful, painful, painful experiences. You're going to go through some things that nobody else understands. You're going to feel like giving up. Has anybody ever felt like giving up? I have. I've felt like giving up. You know, when, you, when we say we feel like giving up, it's not like this thing of like, you know, I don't even know how to define it. It's just a feeling. I think part of giving up is just, I'll just settle for what I got. Did you hear that? I'm just going to, I think I'm going to give up because to, to take another chance, to, t- to go further with this, to go, to take another step. I, I've seen it before. It's just too many problems, too many challenges. That's giving up. But what is Jesus saying to us in our relationship with him? He's saying, I want you to never give up. I want you to insist. I want you to get a spiritual good attitude. I want you to have a healthy, forceful mindset. I want you to be able to face some problems at work and home and relationships and money and finances instead of saying, I don't really know how to handle this. I want you to insist, but God says this is who I am. I want you, Jesus is saying, for you to get a declaration of faith in your heart that says, God has not given me a spirit of fear. Some of you need to cast out fear in your life this morning. God has not given me a spirit of fear. He has given me what? A spirit of power. He's given me power, love, and a sound mind. Let's stand on our feet. He wants us to be a church that insists on who and what we are in Jesus. And he doesn't want us to turn back if the musicians can come forward. Hey, listen, simply, simply, I'm here to encourage you. I read that book, and I honestly literally underlined probably every other sentence. I'm so glad I took it. I started writing in the margins, here's a message, and I ended up with like 30 different types of messages. You know why? Because I believe at Castle Church, God has called us to be a nevertheless church. He's called us to be a church to help other people not give up. But that means you need to be strong. That means, that means you need to take all the trials that you've had and some of the hardships you've gone through and you need to say, well, this is something now I can help somebody else in because he's helped me. Does anybody recognize in your heart or in your thinking that you don't do a lot of insisting, that it's easy for other people to insist on what you should be, but I don't know what you should be in Jesus. I just want to pray for you. Can we bow our heads? I want to pray for you. Pray that as you walk out of here today, there's, there's something in you that says, I declare my declaration of faith is that I am strong in Jesus. I am going to, because he said I'm free, I am free indeed. Because he said he came to give me life and life abundantly, that's the life I'm going to live. And not only will I insist to rest here, I will persist to overcome, even if it's months of trial, even if it's years. I'm going to stay strong because God's strength and his grace is sufficient. Thank you, Jesus. His grace is sufficient. Start declaring that in your own heart. His grace is sufficient for you. His grace 
will help you with all the thorns in your life that don't seem to go away. His grace will bring healing to you. His grace will cause you to go forward again when you've lost a little step with your vision. His grace is going to cause you to be a strong Christian. So now I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for bearing long with us. And thank you for establishing a clear term and definition of our relationship. Father, we can go to you all the time, anytime. And so, Lord, I pray that we be a church. Lord, help people. It's not going to just happen in a moment, but I pray you to help people to begin to get their strength back. And actually, if I were to pray that correctly, to walk in the strength you already have. You are strong in Jesus. You are strong in him. So, Lord, I pray for those who feel beat up right now, who feel tossed and turned, who feel uncertain about things, that you would renew their vision, renew their strength, renew their resolve, cause the fear to go, and cause us to walk out with self-control, love, and power. Thank you for all that you're doing at Castle Church. We've got so many things to be encouraged by. And I pray that you would encourage your people this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
So I don't, as we're, I'm going to give you three brief announcements as we go, but before we do, I don't like to keep the lights down just for a minute.